Today is the 29th of March, 2012. We are in Schenectady, New York at the Kingsway Apartment Complex. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? My okay, full name is Jerome N. Green, uh, born October 1st, 1925, uh, and I'm living here at the community. And whereabouts were you born? In, in New York City, okay. on the island of Manhattan. Now, did you attend school there? Uh, went through public school, PS 173. Junior High School 115, and went to DeWitt Clinton up in the, in the Bronx, Marshall of Parkway. And my parents, in the beginning of 41, uh, moved to uh, Queens, Regal Park. Mm -hmm. And I went to Forest Hills High School. Uh, and I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was after Pearl Harbor, which was December 7th of 41. Uh, I had a problem, and I won't go into that. I ran away from home. Mm -hmm. uh, I hitchhiked to Florida, and on December 27th of 41, I enlisted in the Army in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, <coughs> at Morrison Field Air Force Base. And you mentioned you were 16 years 16, old. I was 16 October 1st of, of, uh, of 4041. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember how long it took me to get to, to West Palm Beach from, from New York City, but I wanted to get someplace warm in mm -hmm. the wintertime. And, uh, now, you enlisted in the Army. Why did you pick the Army? Any, well, any particular reason? It, West Palm Beach was the Air Force, uh, the Marshall Field Air Force Base. Oh, I see. And they were the Army. Uh, I was sitting on the docks watching the, the ships come in, a 16-year-old kid, uh, and I conjured up a a tale that I could tell somebody how old I was, not 16, you know, mm -hmm. listening on me. And, uh... So you must have told them you were 18? No, or? I told them I was 21. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I really, you know, I told them I was 21. Mm -hmm. And, uh... The biggest problem I had was I was a skinny kid and the doctor said I didn't weigh enough. And then I said, well, I hadn't had a decent meal, you know, living on the road. And I gave him a cock and bull story. Uh -huh. And they signed me up. Uh, they transferred me to uh, uh, Camp Landing in the, in, in the northern part of Florida, outside of Stark, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I was there uh, for about a month when I decided I could tell my parents where I was. I didn't think they could get me out, uh, and they did. And there's my Army discharge papers over there, my Navy discharge papers over there. Uh, I convinced my father in that period of time. I worked on a farm until I was 17. Mm -hmm. Uh, up in uh, Jefferson, New York. But, you know, Stanford, in between Jefferson and Stanford. And, okay. Uh, uh, my father signed for me on my 17th birthday. Okay. Let me just go back a little bit. When you were in the Army, were, <laughs> were they upset when they found out you were only 16? Well, it was very interesting, and I don't remember the gory details, <laughs> but one officer wanted to... Uh, put me in jail, court-martialed me. And one of the other officers, and I don't remember the names, I mean, it was sure. a, a blur at that time, uh, argued that uh, there's a lot of people skipping the draft and don't want any part of it, needed somebody willing to fight for his country. And 
they gave me an honorable discharge. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that, that's what that said. Okay. Uh, for some reason or other, uh, I can still remember my Army serial number, which was 1406-1635, and I can remember my Navy serial number, which was 7074728. Okay. Now, did they give you a ticket to get back home? Yes. Uh, the full uniform, everything. Uh, I came back up on, what was it, the, the Silver Meteor is what they had that was going up the coast from Miami to... Uh, oh, a uh, high-speed train? Yeah. Well, high-speed at that high time. High-speed at that time. <laughs> and I got home and uh, my mother sighed a sigh of relief, you know, that I was still alive. <laughs> And I realized now that I put a great strain on my parents. Mm -hmm. And it was a stupid kid's reason that I ran away from home. And there was a problem in high school. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, I didn't graduate high school. But when I got into the Navy, uh, I enlisted. It was down in the Wall Street area where I was sworn in. I, I think it was Church Street. I don't really don't remember that, but uh, I got on a uh, a train and they shipped me to Great Lakes, and that was in uh, forty two, mm -hmm. October of forty two. Now, what? The, how did the uh, basic training compare uh, <laughs> with the Army and the Navy? Was was the Navy harder or was the Army? Harder? No, the Army was harder because it was very physical. Mm -hmm. uh, the Army put a 60-pound pack on my back and I had to climb a wall and get over a wall on the other side. Uh, I remember it was funny, I could, couldn't make it and there were two guys with a hole in each end of a rifle that I stepped on and they bounced me over the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was in the um, Fifth Signal Service Detachment, and we were attached to uh, the Dixie Division, the Fourth Army. Mm -hmm. And when it came to carrying a, uh, a telephone pole, uh, I think they were 60 foot long, I don't remember. And there was always a short guy in front of me and a short guy behind me, so it rested on my shoulder. and. I was a skinny kid carrying this uh, uh, telephone pole. Uh, when they, when I kicked me out, I came home. We, we slept in tents. It was cold in Stark, Florida. Uh, looking back in retrospect, I'm glad I got out of the army because in the Navy, I always had a nice clean bunk to sleep in. Mm -hmm. No mud to muck around in. Uh, at that point in, in the end of 42, the boot camp in, in, uh, in the Great Lakes, uh, I rushed through, or they rushed me through in three weeks. Really? So there was wow. really no training. Uh, they put me through several tests one of the most interesting tests was they put me in a room with earphones on and I listened to tones and I would mark how I heard it and what mm -hmm. I heard. And going back in that point when I was in school in music appreciation, I was a listener because uh, I couldn't tell the tones. But I passed this test and in three weeks they shipped me down to Key West, Florida and they sent me to sound school. Uh, they've changed the name to Sonar. Okay. And I went through that sound school in four weeks and I graduated with a third class soundman's rating. Then they put me on a train. I went up to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and I got aboard a sub chaser. The sub chaser was a wooden boat, wooden ship, 110 mm -hmm. feet long with about a 12 foot beam. It was the SC-1018, and from the time I got aboard until the time they put me off, I puked my guts out. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it was like, if 
I could have, I would have committed suicide. Now, now how long were you on that ship for? Uh, I don't, let's see, I got on it in November. At the end of November. And we came down from Brooklyn off of Kate Hat Hatteras. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was wicked. I was standing my watches. I got down to Miami, and I don't remember the dates on that. But I wasn't aboard uh, the 1018 three months, two or three months, and they, I was down at the uh, Sub Chaser Training School down in Miami. I was there for about a week and a half, two weeks, and then they put me on a train up to Boston mm -hmm. and to the Charlestown Navy Yard where I picked up the USS Rifles, the DE-6. Mm -hmm. So that was the destroyer escort? The destroyer escort. And that, she was on the ways being built. Uh, she was commissioned in the British Navy because her original letters designation were BDE, a British destroyer escort. Was number six. The way I understood it, uh, all those destroyer escorts, when they were built from one to fifty, were supposed to go to the British, and we could renege. And I'm not too clear on how we backed out of it, but the DEs one, two, three, and four went to Britain. The DE five, which was the Everts the DE-6, which was the Weifels. So all the DEs from the 5, I think, through 50 were Everett's class. Then after that, they changed uh, their configuration. We had a crew of about 140 starting out, and as they, churn as they changed the uh, weaponry on it, we increased and decreased the, the complement, so I'm mm -hmm. not sure what the actual complement was, but we started out with about 140. Uh, as I sat in the sound shack up on the bridge. Now, were you a, a plank holder aboard that oh, ship? Oh, yes, yes, okay. yes. And, in fact, we just had uh, a 25th reunion. Of the of the crews on that, and that that changed over the years. But there's several of us were original plank owners. Mm -hmm. I was probably the baby aboard the ship because uh, we put it in commission April uh, of 1943, and like I said, it was built at the Charlestown Navy Yard. Fortunately, I ran into a guy named Eugene Jones. He was a first-class signalman, and he saw me hanging over the rail. And he gave me a quick education on how to fight seasickness. And within 24 hours, I was as salty as anybody aboard that ship. <laughs> and and what, did, what did you do to well, combat what he the did, seasickness? Uh, we had a... Uh, a denim jacket that had big pockets. And why he took pity on me, I don't know, but he broke a loaf of bread in half and stuck it in each pocket, the half. And he said, the minute you're rich, pull out the white part, swallow it if you can't chew it, but get it down so you have something to come back up. And Wayne, like I, I said, Within hours, I was an old soul. <laughs> uh, I stood my sound watches. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, but at one point, I couldn't take the pinging anymore. It bothered me. And I liked to be out in the weather, mm -hmm. on the weather deck. And Mr. Walker, who was the head of the C Division, uh, I convinced him to let me strike for signalmen. I would still stay in my sound watches, but I could strike for signalmen. Now, now, were you listening for, for submarines? Okay. I made, this is the only thing I don't remember, 
I made nine or ten crossings. Uh, the crossing went from Hampton Roads, Virginia, straight to Gibraltar, down to Casablanca, back to the Straits to get another convoy coming out, and back to New York. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the interesting things, that, and I don't know how to verify all of this, but to me, uh, I remember there was supposedly an imaginary line down the Atlantic called CHOP, C-H-O-P. East of CHOP came under the United States Navy. Uh, uh, west of CHOP came under the United States Navy. East of CHOP was under the Admiralty. Because what we were doing was taking a convoy to the Straits of Gibraltar. We had 13 destroyer escorts, uh, 12 destroyer escorts, and the Coast Guard cutter Campbell, which was a luxurious ship, and that's where the Commodore was, was aboard that. And out from the Mediterranean to the Straits would be six PC boats. They take this 60 foot, 60 ship convoy into the Mediterranean, and we'd go down to Casablanca to wait for the convoy coming out. Mm -hmm. Before we would get to Casablanca, we would get the reports, this ship sunk, that ship sunk. And it was just unbelievable. On uh, May of 44, and I don't remember the exact date, May 10th or 11th, somewhere about that, they changed the rules. Mm -hmm. And we took the convoy through the Straits into the Mediterranean. And we got credit for taking the first convoy into the Mediterranean without losing a ship. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember the exact number. There was a 32 or 36 Junker 88s that attacked us. And I'm not sure where they were based because the Germans were on their last legs getting supplies into the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. the, uh, getting rid of us from that. Uh, and we got, we went in and the next time we went in as far as Bezirti and we just operated all over the Mediterranean. And like I say, I don't know, that was, a, that was, a, that convoy was classified the UGS-40. U.S. to Gibraltar slow, and I was fortunate because I did not have the Merman's run because those guys played havoc. Mm -hmm. But then after that run, we had one more run, and then I got bored. I was a third-class signalman, and the only way I could get off the rifles was volunteer for the amphibs, which I did, and. Volunteering for the FBIBS, I was sent to Little Creek, Virginia. Uh, and that was an interesting setup. Uh, there was a Commander Payne who was putting together a group. Uh, I was on the LSM Group 23. And he had a staff, he had an executive officer a radar officer, a doctor. There was one other officer, and I don't remember. And we had a staff of about 12 or 15 guys. And his staff included a first class signalman and a second class signalman. But at Little Creek, I was a third class signalman. Mm -hmm. And what he had already had was a, a guy from the signal school down in Little Creek who was a second class signalman. So that first day, uh, they had a muster every morning in Little Creek. And then they went down the ranks that they needed and they came, any first class signalman, no first class signalman. Any second class signalman, no second class signalman any third-class signalman with sea duty, prior sea duty, and with myself and another guy. Mm -hmm. uh, 
This other guy had only been to sea for a month, and I already had about 18, 19 months of sea duty. And I was interviewed by Commander Payne and Mr. Montgomery, who was the executive officer. And one of the questions they asked is, did I think I could pass the test to be a second class signalman? I said, yes. I just have to have the books to, to read up on it. Well, the compliment was filled. We left uh, Little Creek, Virginia. Uh, my train went to Chicago. Chicago, we got a train out to uh, San Jose. And that's where the LSM 246 was being built. That was going to be the flagship of LSM Group 23. There were, as I recall, 10 ships in the flotilla. And before we left uh, San Francisco, I had passed the test for a second class signalman. And then they took this other guy that out of the signal school, they made him first class. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the interesting things that happened at a funny spot while we were in San Francisco, everybody had been talking, every, we had coffee or smoking cigarettes or whatever. It was how long we were in for. And I said, I only signed up for two years. Because when I enlisted in the Navy, the enlistment uh, officer asked me, what did I want to sign up for? Two, four, or six years. And there was also something called a kitty cruise which Kitty Cruise was a four-year thing, but you had to be out before you, on your 17th birthday, come in and be out the day before your 21st birthday. Hmm. So I stupidly said, I may not like it, you know, it's time me up for two years. Well, we were sitting on the docks in, in San Francisco when the executive officer, Mr. Montgomery, came up and said, uh, Green, I got some papers for you to sign. And everybody's head turned. What, what kind of papers? Re-enlistment papers. My two years was up. Oh. And I said, what happens if I don't sign them? He says, you are signing at the convenience of the government. That was the terminology they used. And I wish I had met somebody because I, did, I naturally signed the paper and now I was in for the duration. And duration plus six, uh, we left. Uh, San Francisco and went to Pearl Harbor. Unfortunately, the guy that they made first class signalman, last name was Karen, I don't remember what his first name was, but anyhow, uh, he was sick the entire trip from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor. And they put him off and we got another guy, Ken Bourbon, one of the nicest guys I ever met. He came aboard the ship, came back to the compartment where the staff was, sat down, and he was sitting there, he had a Bible in his hand, and said, wow, I can't wait. And everybody Know, looked at him and he said, uh, I guess we got nine days sailing time back to the States. And then he looked at everybody's expression and it was like, we're not going back to the States, we're on the way out. He had already had 26 months in the Pacific. Oh my goodness. Uh, <clears throat> and just about every landing you could think of. And you know something? Wayne did not face him at all. <laughs> he just took it in stride. We became very close friends. Now, where was he from? Somewhere on the West Coast. I think mm -hmm. San Francisco. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing about Ken, uh, <coughs> he made first class. They took me and gave me the test that made me first class so they could get us both off, but we couldn't get Ken off until after the invasion of Okinawa.
we went through that. Uh, Ken was a very religious person, and he ran church, ser church services aboard the ship. About last year sometime, I went into the computer, and I'm, I'm in love with that machine. I went onto Google, and I top, typed in Ken's name. And lo and behold, I find, found out that when the war was over, he got back to San Francisco, became a, by San Francisco standards, a well-known interior decorator, and married, I think he lost his wife, and then he became a Russian Orthodox monk, hmm. Father Simeon. And I went on a computer and I emailed one of the uh, fathers of that order and told him who I was and that I was looking for Ken Bourbon and was this truly Ken Bourbon. And I uh, emailed him some photographs I had of Ken when we were in the Pacific. And I got an email back that, yes, that's the Father Simeon that they knew as Ken Bourbon, but he had died a year wow. before I had got onto that thing. He was just a delightful person to, and uh, he was good as a single man. Mm -hmm. He could send semaphore by standing backwards. Semaphore, you faced the guy that you were sending to. Mm -hmm. He could turn around and have his back to him and still send the message, reversing his flags. Uh, and then when the other person that was receiving, when I was looking through the binoculars, realized the guy had his back to him, he, he fell apart. But uh, we went through the Okinawa thing from April 1st. What, fact, what was that like? Well. Uh, I was still a kid. I was still a kid at that point in time. It was April 1st of, of 45. Uh, we steamed in column. And the first plane shot down on April 1st was one of our own. It was a Navy Kingfisher, and we shot it down. Not my ship, but it was coming down the line when we saw it, it was in flames. And one of the first soldiers shot, shot himself in the leg climbing the wall at Yantan Airfield. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly. But we landed on Green Beach. We came into, I don't remember how many yards offshore, and left off, uh, three LVTs, landing vehicle tracks, with pack howitzers on them, and the Marine complement. Uh, we picked up the six Marines, let me digress, at, at Guadalcanal, and took them into Okinawa. Uh, we uh, had three Sherman tanks on, in fact, that photograph up there uh, in the top is one I took from the bridge on L Day. Okay. Yeah, uh, towards the end, I'm, I'm going to uh, yeah. turn the camera around. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll but, get the pictures. Uh, and it was... We wondered where the action was, really. There was nothing. But on April 6th, they threw kamikaze raid after kamikaze raid. It was just unbelievable. Was your ship attacked by kamikaze? Oh yes, oh yes. One of the things that we, the LSM did after we let the initial landing force off, we would go back and come alongside a, a uh, cargo ship and a transport, and they'd, lower, they'd fill that whole well deck up with uh, supplies for the beach and we'd run into the beach and open the bow doors, let the ramp down and then crews would come in to unload everything. We had gasoline, ammunition, everything you could think possible. 
Uh, one day we were on the beach. Uh, there was a kamikaze raid and there was a LST. About four or five ships, I don't remember, four or five ships down to a right and got hit and went up in a blast of smoke. Uh, we had one kamikaze came in over the hill. There was a hill below us, above us rather, and he came in over the hill. He was so close I could see the pilot in the cockpit. We hit with the 40 millimeter that we had aboard and it, he swerved off and he had, had been heading, I think, there was the AGC-13, which was the Panamint. That was Admiral, Admiral Turner's flagship. And when we hit it, the pilot of that Kamikaze knew that it couldn't make that, swerved off and headed toward a hospital ship. I do not remember which hospital ship it was. I, I think the hope, but I'm not sure. Uh, and there was an LSD, landing ship Dock 5, that hit this plane mm -hmm. with a 5-inch uh, 38, and it just disintegrated the way you see in the movies. Mm -hmm. uh, was anybody scared? I don't know. I think we just took it in stride. This was what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I look back and say, I'd rather be in that position than have been on the beach, you know, crawling around in mud, you know, for the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, war, unfortunately, is a young man's game. You can go back aboard the, the, the DE-6 uh, when we were under attack. There was only one person that made any comment about it. And what it was, we laughed about afterwards because when the junkers came in, uh, the 20 millimeters opened up. The 20, mm -hmm. 20 millimeters were using red tracers. We still had a 1.1, a quad 1.1 aboard. And when that opened up, it was firing white tracers, and they, they were hitting this one Junker 88, but there was a guy on the signal bridge thought they were firing at us, and he yelled, oh, son of the bitches are shooting at us, and he ran off and got hung up on a sound power telephone and fell on the deck. Uh, but it was, how do I explain it? It was... We had funny moments. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I remembered aboard the DE-6, on a convoy coming back, we were, I think, junior shipped in the escorts. And one of the transports broke down. We dropped back to Shirklet all night while she did repairs. Board the six, the signal bridge would move up to the flying bridge at dusk and move down at dawn to the signal bridge. And we had just come down to the signal bridge when the light came and I was on the light. And signaling with the light, you have a reader mm -hmm. and a writer. And I was taking the message and somebody was writing the message for me. Well, it was coming from the merchant ship was we're close enough that they think they would like to make for Bermuda. Fortunately or unfortunately, a guy by the name of Tony Minow, one of the electricians used to come up to the signal bridge because we had a coffee pot the first thing. And he heard this message, went flying down below, got to Mr. Charbonnet, the engineering officer, and said, we're going to Bermuda. The captain, who was Captain Hinckley, great man, came around and met Mr. Charbonnet, and Mr. Charbonnet said, we're going to Bermuda. Captain Hinckley kept a straight face from what I'm told, but the first we heard about it, 
he got a hold of Mr. Walker, who was C Division officer, communications, read him the riot act. Nowhere does he want to know from the engineering officer where his ship is going. And Mr. Walker lined up the signal bridge, the radioman, and the quartermasters. And it was like, nobody's allowed on the signal bridge anymore. <laughs> 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 Oh, well, because of Tony Minow, and we had to kick him off the bridge. And Mr. Walker was one, in fact, Mr. Walker, as a place in my heart, he got me my high school education. Because when I ran away from home and joined the Army, I ran away from high school. Uh, and at one point, on one of our first cruises, Mr. Farmer, who was the executive officer, got a hold of me in the in the wheelhouse. He said, Green, I want to ask you some questions. And he started to ask me some personal questions, you know. Uh, what was my date of birth? Just confirming everything that he had. And he said to me, how would you like to go to Annapolis? Well, you know, 17-year-old kid is like Annapolis is the promised land. And he asked me a lot of questions. Came down to one question was, oh, he, he, at one point he told me that, and I don't remember the names of the test, a GCT test or something like that, I got a very high percentile. Mm -hmm one of the highest he said that he had seen. And that would have gotten me into this preschool. I had to be in and out before my 18th birthday, which I could have done. Mm -hmm. But when he asked me what high school I graduated from, I told him I didn't. Uh, I don't remember his exact words, whether it was just stupid or a stupid kid, but he tore the papers up, threw them in the wastebasket, I wanted to burst into tears, but somebody grabbed my arm and was hurting it. And what it was was Mr. Walker. And he forced me out onto the uh, signal bridge. And he says, you missed this one, you don't have to miss the next one. And he signed me up for Armed Forces Service Institute, where mm -hmm. I got my high school education. And so... But I don't know what would have happened if I wanted, I wanted to re-enlist when my father talked me into coming out. Mm -hmm. Now where were you when, the, uh, when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Do you recall that? That was April of... 45. 45. It was in the Pacific. Mm-hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest things was when President Truman dropped the bomb. Mm -hmm. Because we were already, uh, we had gone back to Pearl Harbor after uh, the, uh, we were at Okinawa for 30 days. We went back to Okinawa, picked up a bunch of piling to bring back to the Philippines when uh, we dropped the bomb because at one point we were told we were going to have to start training for an invasion of the Japanese okay. mainland. Mm -hmm. They started giving me hand-to-hand -hand combat training. I, they gave, outfitted me with a, with a, a wicked knife, uh, brass knuckles at one end and a two-inch mm -hmm. blade at the other. And we got to somewhere in the Pacific, I don't remember where, when the word came about that the Japanese surrender. And uh, the interesting thing is, we're the lead ship, 
and this task force, uh, this task group of, of 10 ships, one of the ships pulled out of line. The ship in front of it dropped back. The two of them lined up. The next thing I know, I'm watching all this through my binoculars, and one of the ships, and I don't remember which one, hoisted the third repeater. The third repeater is a pennant, white with a black stripe down the middle of it, a pennant shape. And it's used to signal the third flag up, it's repeating a, the third repeater. But in port, the third repeater is flown to designate that the captain is not aboard. Mm -hmm. And this went up in this thing, and I'm on the light trying to figure out what the hell they were doing. Did the guy, gentleman on the ship, know what was doing? Commander Payne came up, and I told him what was happening. And he said, find out if the captain left the ship. If he did, tell him to get his ass back aboard. <laughs> and he, I say it just that way. It, mm -hmm. it happened The one captain got off, went on the other ship, and they were hitting the, the scotch bottles, I guess. Uh -huh. So, but I got back from... Uh, to the States, pulled into Portland, Oregon uh, for discharge. Now, <clears throat> when was that? Okay. Uh, Did you go to Japan at all? Yes. We, we ended up in Japan. We ended up in Wakayama. Uh, And the interesting thing in the, in the coming into Japan, since I was a, they had no chiefs aboard, that I was a first class petty officer, we had to get a piece of metal from uh, one of the mills to repair something in one of the bow doors. I don't remember all of the, the details on that. But I went in this, and we beached near some LSTs found a piece of metal that we wanted. We needed something to eat. And I went to the LST to see if we couldn't get some sandwiches. And the, sh the cooks aboard the LST gave us, I don't remember, half a dozen fried egg sandwiches, which we were sitting on the beach eating. And this old Japanese gentleman came by and he was watching us and we gave him one. Uh, it was interesting. He took about the pieces of bread apart, looked at the egg, dropped the egg on the beach, and ate the bread. Like, I don't think he knew what a fried egg sandwich was. No. Uh, you know, it was strange to him, but he was hungry. Mm -hmm. And we had gotten into uh, a lot of things going on. And I remember when we got into Japan, they were trying to stop the American sailors from coming ashore with cigarettes because the army was trying to control the cost of a cigarette. Mm -hmm. What you used to be able to buy for one cigarette was now going to cost a pack of cigarettes. And guys had box cameras. They wouldn't put the film in, they'd shove the cap box camera full of with the Cigarettes. Packs of cigarettes. <laughs> and then the shore patrol got smart. They wanted to turn the little thing to see the number chains in the back. Because there was a number pasted in it. It wouldn't turn. Mm -hmm. Now what the guys would do is sacrifice a, a roll of film, the two or three packs of cigarettes that they could get in the back of that camera by letting the thing turn. I didn't see it personally, but one of the guys said there was one guy going ashore, and he got a friend of his very large shoes. I have no idea how large they were, but he had packs of cigarettes stubbed in the toes. <laughs> and they made him take his shoes off when they saw the way he was walking. But, uh, hmm. Now, how were you treated by the Japanese people? Uh, 
Not bad, because they took it in, in, in stride. The only thing is, uh, one day there were a group of us walking through the streets, and some kids would, would I don't remember what had happened, but one of the guys yelled at the kid a, a curse word about screw Hirohito, but that's not what he said. And the kid came back in English, screw Babe Ruth. Like that was more of an insult to us mm -hmm. than it was to him about Hirohito. But they were nice, you know, and, and since then I've been in Rotary and I've had exchange students from Japan. Uh, I was in Japan uh, Ninety four, ninety five, because we had a Rotary convention in uh, Taipei, and we stopped in Japan on the way over. And you know something. Recently, uh, I have been involved. I have been involved with the Slater since the Slater came mm -hmm. up here, and I. It's got to be about five years ago, I guess that there was a group, uh, there were two men, two Japanese men that were doing a movie, something about Orion, God. They were doing a movie, there was a, an American movie called The Enemy Below, Robert Mitchum. And it was a destroyer escort, a Buckley class uh, destroyer escort hunting a German submarine, and it was a cat and mouse game. Now they were doing a movie about a, an American destroyer escort doing a cat and mouse game with a Japanese submarine. And these two gentlemen, uh, Tim Rizzuto of the Slater called me and said, you are a sound man, they want to know something about uh, sonar and sonar tactics because they want to build us into the movie. And I went down to the Slater and they interviewed me. And they, they were delightful people. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, when it was just about over, I don't know, my, my sense of humor, I guess, I'm glad you guys are on our side now. <laughs> you, know, you ask me how I feel, that, that's, that's the question. I mean, uh -huh. Look at us with Germany. The enemies are now friends. Mm -hmm. The Russians are adversaries. Uh, but I did see the movie because they did finish the movie. Through Tim Rizzuto, they gave Tim uh, a block of tickets to give to the guys, and I got two tickets. Mm -hmm. One of my friends and I went to uh, uh, the Palace Theater in, uh, in Albany. And this was a movie from the Japanese standpoint, and they were the hunted ones in the sub. There's a little bit of a love story, but when it was over, everybody in the audience, all Americans, several hundred, stood up and applauded at the Palace Theater hmm. after they saw the movie. Uh, you have a computer? Mm-hmm. You can go in and get under the last battle under Orion. Uh, and there is a a movie that they made, and I think you could pick it up on the computer, because I told my daughter about it, mm -hmm. and she watched it. And it was a fascinating time. Mm -hmm. When the Slater came up to Albany, I went down. Uh, it was a very emotional day for me uh, to get on something that I had been on for almost two years. 
and I uh, ended up doing tour guide duty. And I, but my legs started to go out and I couldn't climb the ladders anymore and do the mm -hmm. things. But it was very interesting to have some of the young people that I took through, like there was one young lady, young lady, she, she was a parent of some kind, I guess. When I was through, she said, where did the women sleep? There were no women in no. World War II. <laughs> World War II. <clears throat> I mean, it's like, you know, we did stupid things. Uh, like when I got aboard the ship in the Pacific, we didn't make fresh water like we had it all the time. And we ended up stripping down naked when it, when it rained and we lathered up in the rainstorm and rinsed it off with, with salt water. Mm -hmm. Aboard the DE we had uh, water, but we had to, guys would take the uh, coils out of the desalinators and ship the scale off the salt so that they could put it back in and make more salt water, make more fresh water. Food was good. Uh, aboard the destroyer escort, we learned to. Live. You made friends with a cook. Mm -hmm. And I, Bud Wright, was a second class cook, and he and I were very close. In fact, through a blind date, I introduced him to his, now his wife. I love peaches, canned peaches, and I love the juice. The terrines that would come down to the compartments. There's a, there were three or four terrines in a row that a mess cook would bring back down. And uh, there's no juice. There's the peaches. Okay, bring it in. Okay, go ahead. There was no juice. The next day, there was no juice. And all of a sudden, we're getting peaches for dessert, but there's no juice. Well, I went up to the galley. I got all a bun. I said, what's with the peach juice? He said, shut your mouth. And I said, why? And he took me in the corner. We used to get water for the batteries for the radio in huge glass jugs. Uh, there was in a wooden crate. They had to be about 18 or 20 inches square, so high. They had one in the corner that was filled with peach juice. And they had put yeast in it and sugar. And the constant rolling of the ship was keeping it stirred. They were making peach brandy. <laughs> and, you know, there were things like that. I'll never forget one time being junior ship in the convoy in July and August. There was a point where we had to run up and down every line of ships. and check the name board. We'd fly a signal flag, show your name board. And then we had sheets of papers. Now the signal bridge, on the, if you go down to the Slater on the signal bridge, is where the big 24-inch carbonoff bike uh, and the 12-inch incandescent. And then there's a ladder up the side to the flying bridge. And they had to be signed. The number two gun was the ready gun. And there was always a crew on it. And I saw the guys with a pitcher of lemonade. And I went around, I, running up the ladder, getting the signatures on the forms, coming back down. I asked the guys with the gun for a cup of lemonade. I got, it was beautiful. It was the most refreshing drink I ever had. I 
did this several more times, and I got another cup, and now the guys are laughing, and they're watching me. Now I'm at the top of this ladder, hanging on, uh, talking to, I guess it was Mr. Miller, about, he said, you were right? I said, it's going to be the heat. What it was, they had mixed up. I don't know the percentages. They had powdered lemonade, water, medical alcohol, which I guess is about 180 or 190 proof, and water. And it was a delicious lemonade drink, but it had a kick to it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was amazing how some of the guys would go through anything. On the signal bridge, we had a concoction with medical alcohol and ground chalk. And what we do, we use that to clean the mirrors and the lenses of the signal lights. And we use a special rig that we would shake this up, coat the mirror with it, cleaning it, and then brushing off the chalk. Mm -hmm. One morning, as I mentioned before, that we would, the signal bridge would come into effect at dawn when we come down from the flying bridge, a um, signal locker was busted into. Somebody stole two quarts of our chalked alcohol. That stuff had to be deadly. But whoever the culprits were also stole two or three loaves of bread and they cut the ends off of each loaf and filtered the chalk through bread to get the alcohol that they wanted. Hmm. And you know, the ingenuity in the Pacific, one of the things we had on the LSM, we had movies. Uh, and we had a 16 millimeter projector and we set up a movie and we had a guy, whenever we would anchor it out, this was after the war was over, to go looking for a ship to swap a movie with. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one movie, I shouldn't say this, with, I never liked this lady because of that stupid movie, because that's all we had to show, with Jane Powell with her singing with the stupid kids. But at one point we were able to get Destination Tokyo with Cary Grant. And we told the guy that you swap that movie and you make sure you get a good movie. Well, he came back not only with a good movie, but a case of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola syrup. And it was interesting, the crew on that LSM was only 44 guys plus the, uh, the staff of the group, so maybe 50 some odd guys. And they came up with, my mother had a thing called a soda maker that made carbonated water. Hmm made carbonated water with the little cartridges. Okay. Well, the life belts we had in the Pacific were not the KPOC life belts that I had when I was in the Atlantic, but this was a belt that had two CO2 cartridges in it. And then all you had to do was squeeze the belt and it would inflate. This was like the Mae West that the pilots had. All he did was yank it and the mm -hmm. thing would inflate. Uh, cut to the quick, they took one of these giant jugs that they made that they had battery water in. They had it with water. They had it covered with uh, strips of metal. And they cut apart a couple of life belts and they made carbonated water. I don't remember what movie we had, but we had Coca-Cola syrup with Coca-Cola. <laughs> 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 but, you know, there's 
when we got together in reunions, we would laugh at the, the funny things. Uh, if you've seen Mr. Roberts, they have a thing in there with the guys who are walking through the binoculars at the nurses' quarters. We came into Bizerti, and there was a French hospital. And we always took what we call a long glass liberty. We had a long glass that was mounted on the 24-inch light that you could see what was going on, binoculars. I was on that uh, light one day when we were coming into Missouri, and I almost choked. There were French nurses. Okay, you mentioned the French nurses? Yeah, and there was a hospital there, but they had a screen up, but the nurses were standing on the seawood side of the screen and changing their bathing suits, and they were bathing topless. Well, it didn't take a second that every pair of binoculars was gotten a hold of and everybody was gawking at <laughs> the French nurses. One of the things we had, everybody was looking for a telescopic thing. We had three three-inch fifties. They were the, the main armament on that DE. There was a pointer and a trainer and each one had a, each seat had a telescopic sight. So all three guns were aimed at the beach. Two guys, I don't remember how, I've never used it, but up on the mast we had a range finder in case the radar was ever shot out. And there were two guys up there. And that's when the captain saw what was going on. And he went up to the bridge to find out what was happening and he blew his stack. And the reason he blew his stack where somebody was using his binoculars and he didn't know what his own settings were to get the things in focus. And <laughs> I gotta tell you, it was <laughs> unbelievable the, the stupid things we pulled. So uh, once you got out, uh, you mentioned the, the fellow named Burb, Bourbon. Were, were you able to stay in contact with anyone else? Well, only from the DE. Mm -hmm. uh, what had happened was uh, we had moved around a lot. Uh, I had worked in New York City. I was tapped for a job at the Lamp Division of General Electric out in Cleveland and went out there and then came back to the Pepsi-Cola company because they tapped me to come to work for them, repairing company. And then I didn't have a master's degree, so I was on my way out. And I had an opportunity, my wife and I hocked everything and we bought a business up here in Albany. I was a beer distributor. And, uh, This is what happens to me at times. I lost my train of thought. Oh, I, I was asking about if you stayed in contact oh, with yes. anyone else. Well, uh, I, living outside of Altamont for almost 40 years, uh, I was a member of the Altamont Fire Department and I was a member of the Altamont Rescue Squad. And I met a guy from uh, Fort Hunter. Don't remember his name. And we were talking one day uh, about Navy experiences and he mentioned when I mentioned the DE, he said, am I a member of DESA? I didn't know what DESA was. So I signed up and I got the paper. And in the paper, lo and behold, there was a, a little blurb from a guy named Ed Marsh about a reunion of the crew of the Wifels.
Ed Walsh is in that photograph. He's the one that just died uh, last year. Uh, I called him, and next thing I know, we had a reunion in Charleston, South Carolina. And it was the first. From that reunion, there was a one of the guys, uh, from, uh, Vermont, his, uh, father owned Hogback Mountain, and he and I were, got to be very close, and, uh, we met again at the reunion, and we talked about Mr. Walker who I mentioned, Mr. Walker was, he retired as superintendent of schools of Dover, New Hampshire. And like I said, he was the one that got me my high school education. Mm -hmm. And Charleston and we had a lot of photographs and I called Mr. Walker's house in Dover mm -hmm. because I found out he had congestive heart failure mm. and talked to him a while, introduced myself and he remembered me and it was, would you be interested in having some company? We drive over. And I would get Arnold White, and the two of us would come over because he remembered Arnold. Also, Arnold mm -hmm. was the boatswain mate. Well, uh, week and a half, two weeks later, I got the films back, and I called up. And because he was very sick, I spoke to his wife, Mr. Walker's wife, Ruth. <coughs> Is he well enough to have company? And she said he's talked about nothing but. Well, my wife, Marcy, we drove over to uh, Marlboro, Vermont, mm -hmm. picked up Arnold White, and drove on over to Dover that day, and we had a wonderful, it was a, a crying session. Uh, and one of the things that set him off in crying is I had a certificate that when I went from Shannonman third class to Sigelman third class, Mm -hmm. He was the one that signed off on the papers, and I had that. And he looked at that and just got very mm -hmm. emotional. Uh, he died two years later, uh, and his wife and son, the son could have been a double, looked just like him, full commander in the Navy when he retired, the son. Mm -hmm. uh, they attended one of our reunions. And I've never been able to get a reunion together or meet anybody from the uh, LSM. I don't know why. Uh, I have photographs and stuff for the people. Uh, the LSM has a group called the Alligator Rally. I think it's over there. There's a, there's a paper. But oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I'll just hold no, that up. That's the LSM, the LSMR. The LSMR is, well, take a look at that LSM up there. It's got an open well deck where the tanks are were kept in. All right, let me, uh, let me just uh, switch over to there. Now, which, which, uh... The, the middle picture with the tank leaving the ship. Oh, okay. Zoom in on it. Actually, I'm going to have to get back a little farther, okay. I think. Okay.
Okay. All right. And while I'm up, let me get these other. This one on the left is. What ship is that I'm looking at? That's the DE. Okay. Okay. And then over here. Oh, I'm going to some glare. The LSM 246. I think that was up at Guadalcanal. Okay. And this is your army. Discharge. Yeah. Yeah, this doesn't always work the best in the in the lighting in your awards. You want me to, want me to turn this light back on? Uh, yeah, try that. See if that's any better. Oh, okay. All right, then uh, I can zoom in on your Navy discharge. Let me get this out of the way. Okay. These were the ribbons and the battle stars that I wore on my uniform. Uh, after one of the reunions that we had, the Navy, or the government, issued a combat action ribbon. Uh, Okay, that's, now I'm, that's this one here. Wait a minute, I'm losing the, uh, the clarity here. Okay. Now I think we might have too much light. Oh. Whoops. Okay, this. All right. <laughs> Let me just try turning, stopping. All right, we'll try the uh, Navy discharge again. it again. Hmm. All right, we're back. Unfortunately, I couldn't focus in on the, the uh, discharge very well. So, and you mentioned uh, your your reunions. Uh, did did you join uh, any veterans organizations at all? Uh, but besides the. Uh, no, I didn't, and I don't know why. I, I don't know why. Okay. Uh, at one point, uh, I was going to join the reserve because after I got back to the States and I got married, the group of guys that we were with wanted to uh, join the Naval Reserve. Mm -hmm. But there was a question of how we got, uh, we lived in Queens, the borough of Queens, and how to get to the Naval Reserve thing, which was in Whitestone, it was under the Whitestone Bridge, and getting a car, and then this all settled down to this one night, we were going to go tomorrow night. And then President Truman called out the reserves for Korea. And that squashed anybody's idea of joining the I reserve. was going to ask if you got called up for Korea. <laughs> no, no, no. no, because when I uh, re-enlisted when we were in San Francisco before getting out to the Pacific, that was the two years and then my time went through on uh, 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 the duration plus six months. Mm -hmm. And I was in uh, because of some words I had with the executive officer of the ship. Uh, they put me off in the Philippines in Tacloban, and uh, it was a very interesting uh, set of events. The executive officer and the commander of the LSM group was 
transferred, but the, the staff was still left, and I was part of the staff. And because I didn't get along with the executive officer of the uh, LSM, they got me off. And they said, well, you got a problem. I got my sea bag. I checked in uh, at the docks. They assigned me a tent. I walked about a mile up the road to the tent, got in. Somebody came in and said they posted a new list on a bulletin board. I walked a mile back down toward the docks, and lo and behold, my name's on the list. I walked another mile back up the road, got my sea bag, and came back down to the docks, and got aboard the uh, the USS Sorgus, LSV-4. It was a giant troop ship uh, with... Uh, landing vehicles and everything on it, mm -hmm. and I was assigned the bunk. There were five or six high. We got back, uh, Paul and Oregon, signed to a barracks, and one of the guys said to me, uh, hey Green, let's get mustered out up here in Portland. Uh, we're going to get $300, and there's a guy down the road who's selling uh, some Indian motorcycles. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, I don't remember the figure, 80 bucks, 90 bucks, some ridiculous number. I said, I've never been on a motorcycle. I said, but it's winter time. Well, that's all right. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll get the motorcycles here, we'll drive down the coast, go down to the southern part of California and then come over through Texas and come back to the East Coast. By the time we get there, it'll be springtime and we can come up never running any color. How difficult is it to run a, <laughs> drive a motorcycle? Well, we <laughs> went down to the place. They sat me on a motorcycle. <clears throat> I started it. They showed me how to do the thing, and I gunned the engine, that stupid motorcycle, went down the road and I sat down on the ground as hard as I could, and I said, I'll take the train. <laughs> 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 and what we did was, uh, they were boxcars. We had old-fashioned coaches that had, the seats would flip over and you could lift the seat off and stretch it across the seat so that you could lay out. Uh, there was a two boxcars in that train that were actually galley, and everything was done with sterno. And we came across uh, the country, and it was a beautiful trip. I mean, it was a way to see a lot of scenery and mm -hmm. everything like that. But uh, I got discharged at Lido Beach, and at Lido Beach they uh, got a hold of me and they said they'll make my first class a permanent rating and they'll give me a temporary chief if I want to sign over. But my father talked me into coming out. So uh, <clears throat> you went home. Did you uh, make use of that 5220 club or the G GI yes. Bill at all? Yes. Uh, well, we had, my father sent us up and uh, suggested that my uncle and I get into a business. I didn't like my uncle that much, so that's why the thing kind of fell apart. And I left because uh, my sister moved out to California with her husband, and I said something to my wife about moving out there. And, uh, she gave notice at her company. It was a very interesting uh, company. They made animation for displays, trade show displays, window displays. And she gave her notice and they said, why? And she said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to drive out to California and look for a job. 
and uh, Ed Burnett, who was one of the partners, said, have them come in to see me. And I like machinery. And they had every kind of machine you could think of. Every type of lathe, every type of milling machine. And they convinced me to go to work for them. Hmm. I went to work for them. Then I got to another company um, that made battery-operated motors. And then one day on the train ride going home, because I lived in uh, Huntington Station, and I was on a train, there was a guy from uh, Popeye, P-O-P-A-I, Point of Purchase Advertising Institute, said, Jerry, General Electric is looking for a guy like you. Why don't you give him a call? And he gave me the n telephone number. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I called and I spoke to Don Mays and he came in and interviewed me. And the inter interview was very, very interesting. Uh, we were at the uh, Saverin Coffee Bar at the Waldorf Astoria having a kind of a brunch. And I have to digress and say that uh, in 1959, Christmas, was the last time I had a, any alcoholic beverages. I don't remember all the gory details, but it's just I, I, my taste buds just went and I didn't have any more. I got home drunk as a skunk. My daughter was five years old, my oldest daughter. Mm -hmm. I remember dancing her around the living room floor and her saying to my wife, is my daddy drunk? Fell asleep, I got up and for some reason or other, I'd never had another drink of alcohol. Wow. Uh, coming back down to Don Mays interviewing me about General Electric, he said to me, uh, how are you at parties? I says, if by that do you mean do I drink alcohol? I says, I don't like it. I didn't go into any detail that I was Mm -hmm. close to becoming an alcoholic or not. I said, I just don't like it. And a few minutes later, I said, why do I, he sounded like he was interested, but why do I want to move to Cleveland, Ohio? And he put a smile on his face when I said, why is the job open? Well, it seemed they had a guy that they had liked but was an alcoholic and they could never rely on him. Oh. And the lab division had a, were fantastic with their employees in that what they ended up doing was sending his checks home to his wife. So he had no money. She'd bring him to work in the morning and pick him up at night. Then they put the word out to all the suppliers. Now, when I went to work for them in 1963, I had a million, a million and a quarter budget. And in 1963, that was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. They told every supplier that if they get caught giving Gordy Conco any kind of alcoholic beverages for parties or whatever, bottles, they'll never do work for GE again. Where he got the stuff, they don't know, but they went looking, and they got me. And that's how I got to General Electric. Then Pepsi tapped tap me, mm -hmm. and I went to work for Pepsi in 68. Uh, they were still in New York City, but they were building and purchased New York. Mm -hmm. And I went up there, and it was... I liked it until management changed and they wanted MBAs and I didn't have an MBA. You know, I went to City College, CCNY, and then NYU. Mm -hmm. Did that at night schools. And you got your uh, bachelor's degree? Uh, not quite, but I figured that was enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? I grew up. Mm -hmm. 
I am an advocate of military service for anybody that doesn't know where they're going. Uh, I know a lot of people say no, go against the military service, but there's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. uh, are we right? Are we wrong? I'm not going to debate that. But they did nothing wrong by me. And I know a lot of young people that have been in the military. My grandson is not in the military. My granddaughter is not in the military. Uh, that's their decision to make. I have two daughters. They are not in the, neither one of them went in the military. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Thank you. I probably jumped around a lot. No, that, that's, that's fine.